Hello everyone, welcome to the Christ Motor GP podcast and after an incredible race in Coda, we've got plenty to discuss. Pete, we'll just get straight into it. Maverick Vignal is, is officially the first person to win on three different manufacturers in the MotoGP era. What an incredible weekend for him. It was pretty much a dream weekend, wasn't it? I mean, st- not just to do the double, but the way he did it, wasn't it? Leading from the front in the sprint and then having to fight right the way back from what the bottom end of the top 10 in the in the Grand Prix. Uh, yeah, I mean, just fantastic for Maverick. I suppose, you know, we've got to start to think of him as a, as a title contender, really, haven't we? If he can t- continue this run. Yeah. I mean, he's won every race he's finished for the last, uh, what, four, four races, if you like. Only the gearbox in Portimao that went wrong and he was on, on line for a podium there. So... Yeah, we didn't know, did we, coming into the weekend, would he be able to carry the speed that he had in Portimao to a different track? Um, I think we were all speaking about, you know, he is good at Kota, so that that was on his side already. But without doubt, he carried that speed and more, didn't he, into this weekend? And, uh, you know, it just shows also that whatever that setting is that they finally found with the bike, he was searching for all the way through the winter, keep saying, you know, he kept saying, no, the balance is not not what I need. It's not what I had on the other bike at the end of the last year. Of course, the bike had changed, so you've got to start all that work again. It looks like whatever they find works, and uh, yeah, spectacular. Yeah, Rob, it was an incredible weekend for him. You know, he was so unlucky in Portimao, and to reset and come back and be even stronger. I mean, the pace that he had in both races, just incredible, really. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've seen in the past, Vinales have those sorts of, let's say, special weekends where he puts it all together, wins the race, qualifies on pole. And he's very hard to beat. But I think the consistency that he did it with this weekend, to put it on pole you know, with a new lap record, the only rider to do a sub two minute point one second lap, then to win the sprint in dominant fashion. I think it was the first couple of laps he had uh, Mark Marquez with him. And then the third lap, it was just eight tenths quicker and it just broke the stranglehold of the, the race, essentially split the group up. And then, I mean, yesterday I... You know, I call it his best ever race. And I think yeah. we've always seen, whether it's through contact or him just naturally starting down the order, we've we've been waiting for him to produce on a weekend where he's shown that pace, but for some reason it's gone wrong. But what he did yesterday, to have the incident at turn one, drop to 11th, and then just come through the pack the way he did, overtaking the biggest names in the sport, um, and, and then still win in dominant fashion again. I think he'll look back at it as one of his best races ever. And I think it's definitely the sort of potential that he showed. You can't look past him as a title contender at the at the moment. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I think for me personally, I think it's the best weekend he's ever had in MotoGP. You know, it's kind of ironic, you know, maybe seven years ago, we expected this from Maverick on a, a weekly basis on the Yamaha. And it's maybe taken to this point. We know he's an incredible rider, but when he's in that vein of form that, he can't be stopped and I think like you say Rob when he got pushed wide at turn one and I thought maybe it's history repeating itself he was middle of the pack is he going to come through we know he has the pace but with him and the Aprilia this weekend they just they were in a different league compared to the others and especially through that first and last sector he was just untouchable and yeah I'm really happy for him I think he's a He's a different sort of character, Maverick. And people, I think, misunderstand him. You know, there was a lot of... How can we say, he had that breakup with Yamaha. People viewed him a bit differently. But, you know, he's a family man. He was really emotional, i seen, after the race to the zone and the press conference. And they were speaking to him. You know, he was in tears, thanking his family for all the support for the difficult times. And it is a contract year for him, Pete. And he's delivering the perfect results to really, you know, show that he's... a the leader at Aprilia you know, going forward, isn't he? If he carries on like this, yes. I mean, uh, as you said, he took a big gamble, didn't he? Leaving Yamaha for Aprilia, uh, we should say, talking about contracts, wasn't it? Was it back in uh, two or two and a half years ago, I suppose, yeah. now? And, uh, you know, that, that shocked everyone, didn't it? You know, walking out of Yamaha that was then quite, you know, dominant, competitive brand, teammate to Quattararo. He won a race that year, and he, I think he'd been on pole at, was it Assen just before he United? Did, yeah, yeah. Even. And then suddenly that's it. And he goes to Aprilia, who at the time hadn't even had a podium, I don't think. Um, so, he, you know, he he made that leap of faith. He believed in himself. He believed he needed something different. And, uh, yeah, as you say, a lot of people questioned that move and, and said, you know, w- w- are we ever going to see Maverick back at the front again? But 
look at the success they've had. And it's a credit to him. It's a credit to all the guys at Aprilia as well. I mean, just look at what that bike has done as well. If we just take Maverick out of it, credit to the team as well. that They've taken that bike from the back of the grid to the front, literally, haven't they? Yeah. And, uh, you know, to beat the likes of Ducati, KTM, there's, there's you know, the, all the European bikes are fast now. And to, to perform as it, as it did around Kota, Aleish, okay, it was his best weekend. We were just speaking about it off, uh, off camera, weren't we? But still, he was up there, wasn't he? Top five yeah. at his worst track in the sprint. Bit of trouble in the uh, in the main race. He dropped back and had to fight his way through. Obviously, not able to to replicate Vinales's fight back. But still, it was a it was a decent enough result for him, given it is pretty much his worst track. Yeah. So some big races coming up for him as he thinks about his future and everything else. But I think yeah, for for Maverick and Aprilia, coming back to your question, you, you've got to believe it makes sense to continue. Yeah, and you know, I think this is what Aprilia expected when they signed him two years ago. Essentially, they wanted him to be the rider and yeah he had struggles like you, you both mentioned in testing but if he can keep up this form going to circuits that he does like you know he, he's won at Le Mans before he's been very strong like you say Peter Dawson this season's very interesting for him and I think it's great to have Maverick up the front because we know how good he has been on Suzuki on a Yamaha and now he's showing it really on the Prilia I'm here for it and yeah, I'll just actually go through the, the Grand Prix. I'll go through the standing, so if you're listening. So Maverick Vignola is one with Pedro Acosta second place. We'll talk about him in a moment. Enea Bastianini third and Jorge Martin fourth and Peko Bagnaia in fifth. So that's the Grand Prix. And you're wondering, where is the King of Coda? Where is Mar- Marquez's name? If you didn't see the race, he crashed out Rob on lap 11 while in the lead. It was looking to be, you know, his best weekend so far on the Ducati and whatever it was an issue like he said with the brakes it ended in tears for him yeah I think obviously for Marquez this was a big opportunity this weekend um I think we all expected him to maybe uh grab a race win at some point whether that that was the sprint or the Grand Prix um and like you said, he'd just taken the lead and it felt like that, that was his point in the race where he was going to try and push the pace, try and push on and see if he could maybe escape or if he could just... Um, I, I, well, I think for him, he obviously had those braking issues yeah. uh, that we didn't know at the time. So I think for him to just try and get some cool air on the front tyre was just as big as taking the race lead itself. But then obviously came the downfall in that crash, which was a heavy front end fall as well. Um, yeah. It was very, very disappointing for Marquez. I think he would have expected to have at least won a race. It was his best weekend in terms of pace on the Ducati, but at the same time, we probably expected that just naturally given his record at at Cota. Um, But I think it's hard to say it's a big missed opportunity because it wasn't his fault. There There were breaking issues, but what it has done is dropped him further down in the championship. And after... Three rounds will already be, I think it's, it's what, 44 points behind Marty. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a big deficit already. Um, so he'll be he'll be very disappointed that he didn't um, at least get on the podium in the Grand Prix. Yeah, and Peter, it was uh, such an epic battle in that Grand Prix for those 11 laps with Mark. You know, he, he'd made contact with Martin. You know, there was a bit of bumping and barging, but, you know, the overtakes were fantastic with him and Pedro Acosta. It was lining up to be an all time great race with those and everyone in it it still was a fantastic race in the end but you know when you look back at Mark's weekends when you heard his comments after the race do you think he was disappointed or was he optimistic you know that this is a right direction even though the result wasn't what he wanted yeah we speak about this earlier we Rob uh, just just chatting and um, you know I think it's almost similar to Vinales's gearbox problem the, the situation because a bit like Vinales was saying look I'm I'm happy, even though I got I walked away with nothing. I was fast when it happened. I know why it happened. Let's get to the next race. And I think it's almost a bit of that with Mark. You know, he knows why he went down. There was the issue with the brakes. Let's not forget, he also he was missing a wing as well, wasn't he? That's after true. that earlier yeah. contact, so we had damaged, <laughs> clear damage to the bike in in one area. Another part of the bike that wasn't working too well. He was miles ahead of the next GP twenty threes again. Where I think. Uh, uh, did did he had his pretty much his best race of the year? Didn't yep. he? But what nine seconds or something from the lead at the end? Mm-hmm. You know, almost half a second a lap. So uh, again, he you know Mark was up there. It's going to hurt, isn't it? You know, falling out of the lead at one of his best tracks. Obviously, 
he's gonna you know he's gonna be replaying that in his mind i'm sure but he knows why it happened and he was fast again and he and he made a step and it once we found out about that broke those brake problems it kind of made sense the incidents that you mentioned the clipping martin and as rob as rob mentioned the reasons for it it wasn't just that he was you know inconsistent braking having to pump the lever but also he's in a rush to try and get to the front to try and get yeah. some clear air on the bike so those two things together were making him sort of try and sort of desperately get in front of people and then of course as soon as he does that that's when he falls so we'll never know what might have happened between him and maverick uh you know if he'd have stayed on it's 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 certainly not guaranteed that mark would have won is it and i think that's also something that that maybe will be a bit of consolation maybe mark's looking at that you know the the speed of maverick at the end of the race and saying you know what i think he probably would have got me anyway yeah. so with that in mind he said he wanted a podium didn't he that was that was what he said publicly i i'll, I'll sign for a podium he got one in the sprint. He was on course for one, or certainly quick enough for one in the Grand Prix. Yeah. So I think for his third race on the bike, yeah, it's it's a missed opportunity, but a lot of positives as well. Yeah, there's a lot of, um, how could we say, there's positivity there. You know, he did lose, yeah, a lot of points if in the Grand Prix, but I think he'd rather be crashing out of the lead, knowing that he's quick and he can be there with these guys. And, you know, his day will come. I don't, I don't think, let, looking at his comments after, there was a bit of optimism there. And he knows that there was an issue. He was trying his best to work with the issue. But, you know, even the greats of this sport, when the issues go against him, like, they can't always put off miracles. And I think Mark Marquez was great. So he was this weekend. And I think it reaffirmed a lot of people. Yeah, this guy, for his third race on a Ducati, and he's still, like you've mentioned, Pete, so far clear of the 23s. Yeah, he is. Uh, he's going to be a factor in many races this season. And I do think there is... Yeah, he'll look at it as a, a good weekend, even though the result in the Grand Prix wasn't there. Jorge Martin, now, I did promise in the last podcast that we would talk about him. And I still think he did score a podium in the sprint, Pete. But didn't score one in the Grand Prix. But I still think he's the man to beat. You know, I've, what, what was your thoughts on his weekend? Yeah, his podium run finally ends, doesn't it? He'd been there every race. Of the, of the, he'd done five in a row and he counted in the sprints as well. He'd been on the he'd done that consistency, as we spoke about uh, in the previous podcast. The thing that he needed to do, get that consistency, he delivered it. As you say, a bit of a disappointing race for him on Sunday. But I think he, from his own words, he paid the price for those qualifying falls. He didn't get to try the medium rear tyre because he lost time with all the chaos with the accident and things like that. And so, yeah, Finales, Acosta, they went with the medium, didn't they, in the uh, in the Grand Prix. Bastianini was on the soft and Martin was on the soft. So really, Martin was there battling with the best guy on the soft, if you yeah. like, the soft rear. Um, and Mark Marquez was also on the soft, so he would have been up there as well. So he, he was there, he was near enough. Uh, he lost out to Bastianini at the end. I think one of you guys pointed out last week that you know Bastianini's he's good on the on the tires at the end of the race and yeah. that's probably what made the difference in that fight there I would say is that you know with that soft rear Bastianini just had a bit more grip left at the end but still far from a disaster brings home the points and uh, you know uh, keeps that healthy championship lead he doesn't want to talk about it but he's doing everything <laughs> right at the moment isn't he? he he definitely is Rob you know as Pete mentioned qualifying it was deja vu for him in qualifying he suffered two crashes in qualifying last year and he started 12th. This time he suffered two crashes. The second one was a really, it was a quick crash that he had. Lucky to get up and get back to the pits with that. Still qualified sixth. But, you know, when he looks at the weekend, a third place and a fourth place, that's, that's very good, isn't it, still? Yeah, it's a very good weekend all around for Marty. Obviously, coming off Friday and the sort of performance he showed in practice, Qualifying was definitely um, not what we expected. To have those two crashes, um, both times on his first flying lap, in the sense of obviously his first lap out, he had the front end crash, got back on the bike. I think he surprised a lot of people when he didn't go into pit lane and he went for another lap. And then he obviously, coming through the last sector, had the bike where it sort of it kicked on the rear and then sort of yeah. um, pushed him off on the front again. Um, so his qualifying was massively ham hampered by that but to put it on the second row and and show that again even with such dramas going on he could he could get over that and and basically his race if i think was saved by the fact that he was able to get back onto the second row if he hadn't have done yeah. that i think it would have made it a lot harder and then his pace in both races i mean he made good starts which was key 
uh, and then he was able to to fight at the front. He clearly just didn't have the tire and the pace at the end of the Grand Prix. Once yeah. Vinales sort of came through, it was he really struggled to hold on to Vinales and Acosta actually. But again, the consistency he showed, and to come away with more points and a you know increased championship lead, I think he'll be really really happy with that. Yeah, just pipped to the podium in the Grand Prix by Enea Bastianini. We'll talk about Enea in a moment. I want to call on to Pedro Acosta, who is just, you know, am I, is it too early to say this, that maybe Pete, maybe it is too early, but he, he is a championship contender, surely, isn't he, Gordon, after this weekend? No, I, I saw that the stat before the start of the year, wasn't it? It was uh, how many races he's got to beat Marquez's win, you know, youngest winner record. And i got to admit, I thought, it's going to be a tough job, but but I mean now you'd almost bet on it, wouldn't you? I mean, yeah. it's even from the next race, and uh, yeah, you know, if you're constantly on the podium and you just need to be winning the races, and then yeah, you are a, a title contender, aren't you? We've been saying about the consistency, and uh, he's up there. He's 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 running wild, but he's not making the big mistakes, is he? He's not falling, and that's that's the key thing. He's he's sort of testing those limits all the time, and um, impressive that uh, just coming back to the tire thing, but that he went with the medium when. All of the other KTM's chose the soft. Yeah, imagine that as a rookie, your third race. All the other guys on the bike, with all their experience, have gone. Ah, yeah, we're going with the soft. And you go, no, I don't think that's right for me. I'll go with the medium. <laughs> and then you know, it just shows the confidence that he's got and the team around him um, to know that you know this is this is what I need to do. And and I think that was even that was a big decision by him. And he he, he made it work. Riding great, uh, as I say, it's that on the on the edge, but but not over the edge too far. And uh, you know, it looks a bit scrappy at times, but he's making it work. And I think that's how he's he's finding, you know, he's he's teasing the limits all the time, but not going too far. And, uh, yeah, you know, that, that's that's amazing bike control to do that. It's fantastic. And, Rob, me and Pete discussed it before we started recording. It's like when you see the onboards, like Pete mentioned, like he is pushing the front so much. But the way he's able to stop the bike, like almost and like run into someone and just turn it, his bike control is outstanding. And... Some people wonder when they come up from Moto2, it takes them a while to adapt. Arguably, you could just say, it's like, oh yeah, this is a better machine. I could do even more on this. I can show people just how good I am. You know, To finish, what? He qualified second. He was then fourth in the sprint. And then he gets second in the Grand Prix after leading a load of laps. And, you know, closing down Maverick in the end, but then Maverick pulled the pin. There's just not enough words to describe how good this kid is. No, the way he's adapted um, has blown my mind for sure. Um, you know, again, his sort of bike control, there was a couple of onboards throughout the, the weekend, one in the sprint and one in the Grand Prix, of him sort of looking directly from the front end of the bike. And he was getting so close. I think one of them was behind Martin. He was getting so close under braking. You're thinking, surely he's he's gone in too deep and he's actually going to pick the bike up and just run wide. And he continued to just stay there, stay there, and actually make the corner perfectly. Um, and then, I mean, he sort of hinted at it post-race that he's not found the limit of the bike yet, which is crazy to think because he definitely, I mean, he appears to be on the limit, but what's, I think, more impressive is it's always under control. You know, he's not crashing. He's not throwing the bike in the gravel. So he's riding, you know, still his, his level of knowledge of the MotoGP bike is you know very low compared to the riders around him and the fact that he's pushing so hard but looking so comfortable while doing it is incredible and i think he's he's getting very very close to a first race win obviously yesterday was an opportunity but vinales had a uh, better pace late yeah. on but i think it just showed again that ktm have got an absolute superstar in their ranks um and the way you know with binder struggling that could have been a, a lost weekend in the past for ktm but acosta's sheer determination and speed to be at the front is just not giving KTM a bad result at the moment. Yeah, exactly. And Pete, why do you think he's so good in the Grand Prix compared to a sprint? Because we've seen it that, not that he kind of gets, well, we've seen Martin kind of rough him up and that kind of annoyed him, but he never really recovered from that on Saturday. But why do you think in the Grand Prix he's able to just be faster? Is it a tyre thing or what, what? what do you think by looking at him? hardest thing is is for a rookie is the one lap in qualifying isn't it and, and you guys have made the point that he's he, he did well on this this uh this weekend and put it on the front row so that's a big box tick that's only the the last thing that they crack because that's when you need to ride the bike at the absolute limit for the whole lap 
And I suppose if you work sort of away from that, the Grand Prix with the longer distance, we know that, that the early part of the race can be quite tactical, can't it? Especially with people on soft tyres. People are not riding yeah. at 100%. They're saving fuel, they're saving the tyre and everything else. We saw it in, in Qatar especially, didn't we? And so you do have a chance and, and you have a longer time to build your speed up. This is also what Marquez says, isn't it? Is that, you know, lap after lap, you can take a little bit more out of a corner. You go, well, well that, that worked. I'll try a little bit more, a little bit more. And then you reach the limit and you step it back a bit. You, by doing those consecutive laps, you're able to uh, to sort of find the limit more. I also think he's probably learning from the riders around him. You know, yeah. racing these 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 great guys at the front, he's studying them, isn't he? He's seeing what they're doing. He's picking things up. Oh, right, that's how they go into that corner. They're gaining they're gaining a bit on me there. I'll try and I'll try and do something differently. Maybe he's also uh, you know literally on the fly, sort of picking up more speed as he goes along. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's incredible what he's doing, and uh, and it's great. And, and you, it's a good point you make about the, the KTM, if you like. What would we be saying if Acosta wasn't there? We'd all be saying, oh, the KTM, what's what's wrong with it? Yeah. You know, you know uh, there's something wrong with the bike. It doesn't work at Kota. And yet, when you've got that one guy, it, it can transform it and make it work. And suddenly it's, well, you know, he's shown that that KTM could work, even when guys like Binder, I think Binder, he had a bit of a foot injury, didn't he? He did, yeah. A bit of a messy weekend, but... And Jack Miller, they seemed to, to hit trouble, didn't they? It was a few, a few obviously the Ducatis that I suppose we'll come on to with the chatter, a few unexpected problems for uh, some bikes that looked really, really sort of well-rounded coming into the weekend. Yeah, um, like you say, Brad Bender, I think, casually dropped in on his, I think it was, was it a Thursday or Friday, Pete, he just said, oh yeah, I kind of like broke something in my foot a few weeks ago. And like, but it's like the most Brad Bender thing of all time, where it's like, yeah, it doesn't really matter. It's like, yeah. Okay, Brad, like everyone else that had done that, a normal person would be off work for two months. But yeah, Fender, yeah, not a bad weekend. I think he kind of, as qualifying was really, it really done him in there. But he still finished ninth in the Grand Prix. And, you know, when he looks at a cost, he's probably going, bloody hell, what are we going to do next when we get the Hareth? A track that they were so fast at last year. So, yeah, I can't wait to see what happens there. That's going to be, yeah, maybe potentially that'll be a cost as. His big moment, he's got the home crowd behind him. He had massive support last year when he was in Moto2. Obviously, MotoGP now. The Spanish are going to be loving that, so let's see what Acosta can do. You mentioned Ducati, Pete. We'll talk about Paco Bagnaia, but simply this factory team. I don't know what's happened to Bagnaia since that sprint race in Portimo, but the chattering issues seem to be really catching him out compared to the other GP24, maybe the other Ducati riders, would you say? Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, uh, what was it? Yeah, it, it seems like there's something's been happening in every race, isn't it? As you say, he, that bobble under braking for the lead in the sprint in Portimao. Then he clashes with Marquez while sort of lacking speed in the Grand Prix. Then you have the, the sprint at Cota and was it a bad tyre? You, you know, they're careful not to say that, but certainly he didn't have the grip he expected from it. Um, but he then used it in the warm-up, the same tyre. Exactly. It seemed to be okay. So he then picks, the, again, the soft the soft re and obviously a new one for the Grand Prix, um, and was great for what half a dozen laps, and then suddenly he just sort of faded away. And it seems like this chatter chatter issue, which has been there off and on, isn't it? Really, all the tracks this year reared its head again, and uh, it, it's it's going to be a worry that that we're five races or five events in. If you count the winter tests as well, um, you know, and the, the problem's still there. And it seems like, obviously, it depends on the grip level. So maybe when the tyres are new, the start of the race, qualifying, it's not so much of an issue. As the grip starts to go down, something all lines up on the bike in terms of the, the vibrations and the frequencies and, and, and again, these chatter issues. And uh, I think Jorge Martin also had a bit of chatter, not yeah. a major issue, but I think he said it cost him maybe one or two tenths a lap. Uh, so it's still there. It's still there. Bastianini also said that, uh, you know, had some strange sort of grip issues during the weekend, not not what he expected in the races. So I think there'll be some head scratching at Ducati, and it will be a concern that we're this far into the season, and they're still having these uh, these, these issues rearing really their head. And uh, for Banyaya, you know, he came into the weekend wanting redemption, didn't he? L lost the lead a year ago. Problems with uh, Marquez in Portimao, and instead, really, yeah, it was uh, you know, where was he? Fifth and eighth or something? Yeah. In the end, yeah. Um, I mean, that's that's obviously not what he's expecting as the reigning champion and really, for many people, the type of favourite. Yeah, as Pete says, Rob, it was a weird weekend for Peko. He said on Friday he felt pretty good from what he had said and he had looked pretty comfortable. He was inside the top three. He was second on Friday after all the practice. So he was really there. He was showing really good pace. But I don't know, with the sprint, it just seemed as the start was really the one that you've seen it. 
you know, he lit the rear up and it kind of lost him out of the seat almost and he had to regroup. And he did okay to finish 8th because he was stuck in 10th for a long time. And, you know, I thought going into the Grand Prix he would show a bit more. And he did in the early laps, like Pete said. But, yeah, when he sees Jorge Martin ahead of him and he sees his teammate ahead of him, you know, it's a lot of head scratching for Peko and his side of the garage, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, to your point, he he called Friday one of the best Fridays he's had in a long time. Uh, and his pace was very good. So it seemed like he was at least going to be somewhat in contention like last year. Obviously, he was quite dominant last year in the in the sprint and then crashed out of the lead. But it was never quite that good of a weekend this time around. And obviously, the sprint, like you said, that star where he got launched really high off the off the line it sort of impacts him straight away he went i think down to 10th and just struggled to pass the likes of raul fernandez morbidelli who were you know to their credit having good weekends but normally riders who aren't fighting for the same positions as banyai but he was struggling to make progress um obviously the chatter and uh he has some tire problems which was the same for bastianini in the sprint um but then the grand prix you know in the early laps, he's got up to third, I think, and he was right there in in the, the battle for the lead and seemed to have more pace. But it was just a case of, and really surprising, actually, that it it just never improved from that point on. We we always think of Banyaya sort of gets stronger as the weekend goes on. Yeah. And by the time the Grand Prix comes around, he's in his best form. He's at one with the bike and he sort of delivers his best performance. But it just, even when he was at the front running sort of behind the likes of Martin and then Bastianini, it just never felt like he could go beyond that. He could do anything more. So a bit of a head scratcher for for Pecco. Obviously, Portimao was a lot of lost points in the race, yep. and to lose points in both races again to Martin, um, be outperformed by Acosta in both races, Vinales. You know he's losing valuable points. It's still so early that we expect him to at some point hit a, a, like a purple patch and, and win some races. Um, but considering his form last year at Cota, I think he'd be quite disappointed with this weekend. Yeah, it's a real, like you've like mentioned, in testing Bagna and maybe Vashnini, they seemed like they were having such a good time of it and there was no real issues there. But Jorge Martin was the one who struggled, maybe the most in testing out of the 24s. Obviously, Frankie didn't have testing due to his injury, but... I don't know what it is. Maybe Martin spent more time trying to fix the issues that they really thought they didn't have, if that, if that makes sense. And maybe now that Bagna has seen that Martin is, yeah, while well, he's ahead of him, and he's like, why am I able to do that? I had a good test in uh, pre-season. I, I, don't, I don't know what to say about Bagna. It's such a strange weekend for him. It wasn't a bad weekend, but it's just very on Peko, like over the past season and a half, you know. I expected more from him, but We'll get to Europe, and I think he'll be very strong. Like we said, Pete, he's very good at bouncing back when he has a, a tough weekend. So I think her F will be a better weekend if he doesn't have these issues. But we'll talk about Anea Bastianini. Uh, Rob, again, just appears out of nowhere. He's always just kind of there in the background. And to get a podium at a circuit that he won at in 2021, or 2022, sorry, a good weekend for him. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, the sprint didn't go probably as he would have liked. And he said after the race that it sort of left him um, not really looking forward to the Grand Prix just because they were sort of worried about potential tyre problems again. But his performance, I think what's important for Bastianini in such a crucial season, the fact that he was able to pass Pecco on track and finish ahead of him on merit and then do the same to Martin, that will be big for, for Bastianini. He got stronger as the race went on and his, I mean, it's becoming a, a common trend now, a little bit like Vinales actually, as the race goes on, his late race pace is honestly stunning at times. Yeah. It's really, really fast. And if there was a few more laps, he probably would have caught up to the back of Acosta. But I think for Bastianini, this is obviously he, he won two races. I think it was 2022 early on in the season, but from a consistency point of view and given what's on the line, in terms of contracts this season, he couldn't really have done much more at this at this juncture. He gelled with the 24 bike, which is a big thing for him, considering the struggles he had adapting to the 23 bike last season. But I think, you know, sort of mentioned it about Acosta, a first win being around the corner. I think Bastianini is in line to win a race soon. 
Um, yeah. Because I think, if anything, the sprint is something Bastianini uses to get even more comfortable for the Grand Prix. And I think that would serve him well at some circuits. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I think you're buying on with that, Robert. It's like he said that. I actually think last season at some point, he's like, well, well, I missed a lot of them because of injury. But when he came back, it was really hard for him to adjust to that. Just essentially, you know, to do qualifying laps every lap in a sprint, but like, yeah, I think he's um he's well placed. And Pete, speaking about Anea, and just focusing on others, you wouldn't want to be Ducati management at the minute, would you? Trying to figure out who you're going to put beside the world champion next year, would you? No, you wouldn't. And I think what what you would want to do is try and stall it or drag it out as long as you can, so you can get <laughs> some more races under your belt, wouldn't you? And 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 really hope that somebody clearly emerges. Because at the moment, as you say, Martin's had a great start to the year, but now suddenly you've got Bastianini as the top Ducati and overtakes Martin, and he's second in the World Championship. So, <laughs> uh, and that's without taking into account Mark Marquez and everything that he might do going forward. So, I think, uh, yeah, your main thing at Ducati right now is just to go, look, guys, we're not going to, you know, just just tell them all that we're not going to make any decisions yet, and just try and get as men- as much information as you can to try and get some sort of pattern <laughs> to emerge of who should be on that bike because uh, you can make a case for all three, can't you? Yeah. Uh, just bring back the days. Remember Repsol Honda had three bikes? That was Davizioso, Pedroza <laughs> and uh, Stoner, yep. Yeah. I think Ducati would love that, but that's not going to happen, of course. Do you know what? Yeah. Just on, on, on that <laughs> point, actually, I think Aprilia are actually doing Ducati a bit of a favour because they're giving Aleish all the time he needs to make a decision. And I think it's exactly. by Mugello, um, sort of like the murmurings are that Aleish is going to make a decision. But if Aleish was to say right here, right now, I'm not going to continue, that would probably push a Pridia to make a quick um, move for either yeah. Martin or Bastianini. But it's actually Definitely. probably going to give Ducati the time they need to Pete's point to see more races and get a better idea of who's in form and putting the better season together. Yeah, that's just brilliant drama for us. And just, you know, I, I love the, the way the writers kind of bat away the questions. That's always my favorite in press conferences where it's like, oh, we're speaking to everybody, but I want to stay where I am. It's like, come on here, give me a, give me something a bit more. But it's so, it's so good. And I, I love the fact we're going into the European season because that's when everything starts to absolutely just crank it up another notch. I'm going to actually stay with Ducati, but on the manufacturer side, Pete, We'll talk about Pramac and Ducati and their relationship. We've seen a report that Yamaha are reportedly sniffing around Pramac and want to have them as a satellite team. Can you just bring us up to date on that and what's the situation? Um, yeah, it's, it's it's definitely a rumor in the paddock that it, that uh, you know exactly how much how serious it is. Who knows? But you do hear the words Pramac and Yamaha. Yeah, so there's certainly I think there's an option to continue obviously with Ducati, but then there's uh, VR46 are saying that that. You know, they look to be now close to to renew with Ducati, and they have an, the option. It's on their side. So, so if they say, "Yeah, we want to, we want to continue Ducati," that's almost a formality. It's they yeah. have the options there on paper. So maybe the the sort of the obvious link with VR46 and Yamaha won't happen. Which, again, we'll just underline that that VR46 and uh, and Rossi, by definition, are, are in much GP to win and to be as exactly. successful as possible, isn't it? And uh, that's all that's going to matter. Even with all the obvious links between Rossi and uh, and Yamaha uh, in the past and the present as an ambassador for, for Yamaha as he is now. Um, so yeah, that, that's the situation. It seems like uh, you've got VR46 who seem to be very close to re- renewing with Ducati, but they want a bit more. They want they want a yeah. factory bike. I think it's pretty clear, isn't it? They 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 know what they did with Bezeki last year. I guess they're also seeing the tough start to this year with the year old bike and knowing that really that's the logical next step for them. Yeah. Um, it, it's interesting, isn't it? We can, we hear this, well, Pramac are the only ones that, that get the factory bike, but then of course, Luca Marini had a factory bike. There were yep. five factory bikes only two years ago. So, so, you know, that rule didn't apply then, but, but we're told that no, you can only, if you want a factory bike, it has to be with Pramac. Um, it'll, very interesting because Pramac obviously is the official satellite team. If you like, there's a lot of Ducati engineers in that team. They've, they've been fantastically successful. Obviously, Martin leading the championship now, runner-up last year, came very close to making history yeah. as the first satellite rider to win. So so you'd think on paper, well, well, just renew it. But obviously, there's always more to these these things that meets the eye behind the scenes, isn't there? And um, yeah, who, who knows exactly how advanced those discussions are? Yamaha, to, to, from their point of view, they, they're still sort of pretty confident i think but not saying much that they will have a satellite team so 
really there's only to 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 rewind a bit there's only three teams isn't there that, that are up for renewal and that's lcr vr46 and pramac so those are yeah. the three options um you know lcr people assume will be staying with honda i mean they've been there with them for so yeah. long so then you've got the pramac and the and the vr46 uh option if yamaha are going to come back we know that that's what they want we know quattro has been pushing for it as well he wants that data so it's uh, it's all about what you offer, isn't it? Uh, you know what you're going to bring to the table, what you offer the satellite teams, whether you can give them. Obviously, if you're Yamaha, you can't offer the same level of machinery as Ducati had at the moment, but but maybe you can offer the financial side, where you can offer them a longer term deal, more stability. Yeah, uh, you know, there's there's always other things that come into play, isn't there? But uh, it's yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens because uh, obviously the longer these things go on. Without uh, an announcement of a renewal, should we say, it just shows that uh, it's it, it's not an easy decision. It's a very complex one because I actually just thought about it. You know, Fermi Aldegar has been sent to a Ducati contract, and where does he go then? If if Pramac decide to go with Yamaha, they can't run a Yamaha and a Ducati in one team. That I mean, that'd be incredible. I'd love to see that. But like, yeah, there's a lot of factors into this, and I think who knows what can happen. I think it's is it Pramac wanted more. Yeah, like you say, Pete, they want the factory status, but would money from Yamaha potentially be like, we'll give you more money to run our bikes? Very, very interested to see how this goes, but we'll stay with Yamaha and the Japanese manufacturers. Lynn Jarvis, I've seen a report from Autosports, says he's saying that he was told, the journalist there, that he's it's last year at Yamaha. Pete, that's a massive sort of, that's a massive story in terms of you know personnel in the paddock, isn't it? Him leaving at the end of the year. It is, yeah. I mean, he, to be honest, he flagged this up in, in February at the Sepang test uh, at the the team launch. Um, so the, I don't know, five or six of us spoke to him afterwards, uh, just uh, in the in the in the paddock, and um, and and he was pretty open about it. You know, he was asked, "Well, can you can you say a bit about your future?" He joked, he said, "You you're all you're all thinking you're going to see David Brivio here, do not you?" You know, <laughs> um, you know, so he's aware of all these rumors that we go right about team personnel changes, and he was having a bit of fun with that, but. But then he did, you know, more seriously say, yeah, you know, look, I'm not getting any younger and uh, there will be a change in the near future. And uh, so, yeah, he, he pretty much made clear that that he's, he's not going to be in that in that exact role. So we yeah. say as team principal and managing director of Yamaha Racing, you know, for much longer. Um, and he also spoke about the replacement. You know, would it be someone Japanese? He was asked and he said, well, I think it'd probably be somebody more European, which also seems to fit in with the report that you mentioned from Autosports. So, yeah. So, so yeah, this is this is kind of so it's more details on what he he kind of flagged up um, at the Sepang test, which is that yeah, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a big move as you say because he's been there. He's one of those guys that brought Rossi in, isn't he? Yeah, um, way back uh, in two thousand three, two thousand four, and started that whole golden era, if you like, for Yamaha. So uh, you know, maybe signing Cotteraro will be you know, it's it's a fitting, if you like, a fitting end to that chapter, yeah. maybe of of Lin at uh, at the head of uh, the Yamaha racing team. I was going to say, Rob, that that would be Lynn Jarvis's his ending legacy. You say he signed Quattro to that, that contract. You know he's secured their future. <sighs> Speaking about Quattro, he did mention in the pre-race press conference that you know there's big changes on the way, and they had this news, of course. But he mentioned about the bike. He can't really say anything. <sighs> they need the changes fast because he did say that they had a, a they're working in a really different way compared to they would maybe a couple of years ago. But the results don't lie. He was 15th in the sprint. And let me just check again. He was 12th in the Grand Prix. I mean, it's still... It's not really shown any progress, is it? No. I think Quasar will be hoping those changes take place now. Um, because, you know, as much as he signed the new deal and, you know, it's security and obviously a bumper payday, um, great for Lin Jarvis that he's pulled that off for Yamaha before he essentially departs. Um, and obviously for Quattro, you know, to stabilise where he is, I think is important. And for him himself, if he can help bring the Yamaha project back to where it needs to be, that will be something sort of legacy changing for him in his career. But at the moment, it's just, there's no signs of it ending. I know he tried to put a positive spin on it after the race, but frankly, there isn't really a positive spin at the moment. Uh, you know, Rin's, Considering where Rins was last year at Cota, a race winner, and this time around, you know, he crashed out, but before crashing, he was absolutely nowhere. Um, and I think someone of Quattararo's ability, and this is no, you know, sort of shade on any of the, the riders who are typically 
further down the order, but Quattaro shouldn't be running in 15th, 14th, 13th position. You know, he's a, a world champion as recently as 2021. And the fact that he's struggling so much to just even crack the top 10 is shows how bad at the moment Yamaha's situation is. And although, you know, they've signed all these engineers from Ducati and they've brought loads of new people in, different methods of working, the results at the end of the day are still the same. Of course, there needs to be a waiting process because it'll take yeah. time, but it's it's not making the job any easier for Quattararo at the moment. Definitely not. I believe Carl Crutchlow is testing this week. I, I heard on a broadcast, I think he's testing the Catalonia, so a private test. They're going to obviously they missed out in Portimao. But yeah, Yamaha need to get something sorted because I believe they were testing stuff throughout that weekend, you know, because they missed Portimao essentially. So. Who knows what's going to happen when they get the hurry I just want to focus on Honda at the very end, Pete. Oh, it was a very difficult weekend, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's, that, that's almost an understatement, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it was almost a nightmare, really, wasn't it? I mean, they they just they had a difficult time in Portimao, hadn't they, as well? But lots of rear grip issues, so it was yeah. a good question mark. What, what, what will Kota be like? Obviously, having won the race last year as well, there was, there was some optimism there. Quite, quite realistically, I mean, uh, you know, Marquez's record as well speaks for itself on the Honda, and then Rins, of course, winning last year. But uh, as Mia, I think, explained, it, the, the Honda's changed so much that it's yeah. kind of lost its strong point, which worked so well at Kota, which was that sort of, you know, the front end, the braking, and everything else. And so they, they don't really have, I think he said, we, we don't have any positives now. You know, we, we've taken away that 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 front end positive to try and improve the traction, but they're not they're not really gaining in that area now either. And uh, yeah, really, I mean, they were the bottom of the timesheets, really, when they all four Hondas most of the weekend. So it, yeah. it wasn't just that one rider didn't like track or had a difficult time. They were all in pretty much the same position. They were all struggling. And uh, yeah, I mean, they a, a bit like Yamaha, they they desperately need testing, don't they? They, they need to to you know, yeah. get, get hundreds of laps um, with all four of them, really, on private test tracks, um, working through parts, working through setups and, and trying to get some some sort of real clear progress here because um yeah this is two events now that have been really really difficult yeah it, it's just it's crazy to think about just they're consistently all with each other when you look at the timings so it's like in practice the bottom four it's most likely four hondas and it's like it just shows they're all having issues but they're not even issues that are all the same they're having some are having problems with the rear then you hear a different thing someone says oh that was okay you're like this doesn't make sense and i think joan Mir hit the nail on the head he said the situation was desperate there is just they need to do something rapidly rob and you know, he crashed out of both races you know and zarko crashed out of the grand prix yesterday so did takanakagami and Mir called uh luke and the like the lone survivor essentially and he was in 16th and last place and it's just it's just really hard to see how they're going to improve isn't it yeah i mean it's not something you want to say but the hondas spent more time in the gravel than i think on on track this weekend um you know joan mir crashed in both races nakagami crashed in both races zarko crashed in the sprint and then retired from the grand prix and then i think it's the second time in three rounds that marini has finished a grand prix behind someone who's crashed Oh, which uh, yeah. is is mind blowing, you know. For someone, you know, we spoke about Rins and his performance last year at Cota. Marini was on the front row last season, yeah. And now if he's essentially touring at the back of the field, just trying to put laps on the Honda, um, and you know, the margin for Marini, obviously, it's a new bike for him. I mean, it's a new bike in general, but it's a new bike for him, and the margin from the rider in front of him, I guess, has been getting smaller, which is a good sign. But then again, in Qatar, it was Miller who crashed and then managed to get back ahead of yep. Marini. And then this time around, it was Alex Marquez. It's just, you know, those sorts of things can't be happening. And that sadly is a reflection on Honda who, you know, have fallen in the last years to a degree that I don't think any of us could have imagined. But they've got a lot of work to do, uh, even more than Yamaha. Uh, and like you said, when you look at the timing screens, Pretty much every session, it feels like you're seeing the two Yamahas, the four Hondas, occupy the six last places. Yeah. Maybe Augusto Fernandez is somewhere there at different times, but there's a lot of problems at Honda at the moment. Yeah, and I don't even know what to say about it. I just 
when I said, I think I said he was off camera, that Mark Marquez crashed out and he'd rather be at the front. And he probably looks back and goes, well, thank God I'm not on the Honda because even he couldn't have salvaged a good result on that bike yesterday. So, yeah. A, a very interesting weekend on both sides of the grid. You know, we had epic battles up front, but even at the back, there was struggles. And it's even even more answers for the Spanish Grand Prix at Jerez. And just to quickly, I'll update you. So Danny Pedroza will be doing a wild card at Jerez. Very excited about that. Of course, he was very fast here last year. And yeah, we'll be back next time for our podcast that we review or a preview of the Spanish Grand Prix. If you enjoyed it, make sure to like the video if you're watching on YouTube. Leave a comment what you thought about the race weekend. Follow, subscribe to wherever you get your podcast from. Leave a five-star review. That helps us out massively on the Apple, Spotify charts list. So yeah, leave a review. Hopefully they're all nice. But yeah, and enjoy this podcast, guys. It was a pleasure to talk about a great Grand Prix. And yeah, we'll see you next time.